Thank you and hello. Uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of myself and David Bannis today, my co-author who couldn't be here. And what you're looking at here on the screen is the very first map of our new book, Portlandness, a Cultural Atlas. And what it does is it reimagines Portland as a blueprint of a house. And we all know that Portland has a living room, right? It's Pioneer Courthouse Square. But we figured, what kind of house only has one room? So we wanted to figure out what the other neighborhoods would be. And so we sort of put this together. And if you look closely, I don't know if you can see from there, you can see that um, Portland's dining room is the Pearl. And Portland's library is Portland State University. And Portland's balcony are the Skidmore Bluffs. And Portland's uh, in-law suite is Vancouver. <laughs> <clears throat> But, and, and so this is kind of a lighthearted look at Portland, but it does something really important for us at the beginning of our book. And it forces us to reimagine a place that we think we know really well. And it forces us to use our geographic imagination to understand a place. And indeed, this is the map that in sort of altered hue made it to the cover of our book. And the book is called Portlandness. But what is Portlandness? What makes Portland Portland? Think about that for a moment. What is it that makes Portland different from every other place? What is it that makes Portland distinct and unique? Or as geographers might say, what is it that gives Portland its senses of place for Portland and its surrounding areas? Are there parts of Portland that are more Portland than others? Does that even make sense? What about the metropolitan area? How Portland is Hillsboro as compared to Beaverton or Gresham? There are insider and outsider views of Portland. But there's not one insider or outsider view. People have different experiences and places, and so they have different senses of place. So it becomes really difficult to represent something like Portland is. Now, when people make postcards, they do this all the time. If you go visit a city, you buy a postcard that's supposed to be emblematic of your entire experience so that you can send that and represent that to somebody else. And we have some postcards on the screen here, but they're not real postcards. They're the ones that we made up ourselves. Uh, and this is a part of the book that got cut called Postcards We'd Like to See. Because our experiment was, what about the views of Portland that we often don't see on postcards? Maybe they should be represented in some way because maybe these reflect some people's experiences and senses of place that are associated with Portland. But of course, this isn't a book about postcards or images, even though it has those in it. It's a book about maps. So how can we represent, represent Portlandness graphically with maps? And that's a really big challenge. We've been working on some form of Portlandness since 2007 or 2008. And so we asked our students to tell us what they thought Portland was like, what it was known for. And we decided we would find surrogate measures to map that relate to those different measures. So one of the things our students claimed was that Portland is a liberal place. So we thought, well, how could we possibly represent this? So we found a voting measure. This was, I think, a measure 80 in 2012, the failed attempt to legalize marijuana in Oregon. And the more purple there is, the more support there was for legalization. And the more red, the less support there was for legalization. Now, is this a perfect surrogate for liberalness? It's clearly not. However, it's a way of talking about things that is, and displaying things on a map that are normally extremely difficult to map. We also asked our students what else they thought. And they said, well, Portland is an environmental city. So we mapped another voting initiative. And this was from several years ago, a 2010 initiative, which would have extended lottery funding to cover parks, beaches, wildlife, and watershed protection. And so this is a different pattern. Uh, the deeper blue or purple here represents a, a more positive vote for that initiative. And then the very little red here represents less support. So at least by these two measures, environmental Portland and liberal Portland are not necessarily exactly the same. <clears throat> our, poor, uh, <clears throat> our students made a wild claim and, and suggested that Portland was known for breweries. So we decided to make a density map of breweries. And we are, if you look at it, pretty close to the brewery belt right now where we are. <laughs> We did some more research and we found out that Portland has the most breweries of any city on the planet Earth. And there was much rejoicing in the class as well. We also asked our students, well, what else is Portland known for? And back in 2008, nobody said food carts. Because although we had food carts, it wasn't 
it wasn't known as well as it is today. And so we decided to make this map of the density of food carts. And as you can see, it's a bit different from the other ones. It's a lot more central, centrally located, the density measure here. It's not as diffuse. And so yet again, it's a different measure. Uh, our students claim that people in Portland don't like to use cars very much. So we decided to research carless commuting and put together this map as sort of a surrogate of green commuting density. And what you can see is that, uh, area, that, it's, that it's not uniform. It's different throughout the city and the region. And also, you can probably pick out bus lines and max lines almost from looking at this because those are the people who have the opportunity to use public transportation the most. You can't tell from this map, but most people in Portland commute by car still. And there was no rejoicing. <laughs> green energy use, uh, green living density. This is information that we got from PGE. Uh, and it, what it depicts here are people who opt to pay more every month to have 100% of their energy consumption offset by renewable sources like wind and hydro. And so we get a little bit of a different pattern again. So what we decided is we would bring all of these measures together and layer them on top of each other in order to get some kind of surrogate Portlandness measure. And so this is the surrogate Portlandness map. And as you can see, it's very dense in the center, and it sort of radiates out and gets less green, sort of less Portlandy, if you will. And we looked at this, and we said, well, this is a little strange, because some parts of Portland aren't very Portland at all. And how can that be? So maybe the problem isn't that these parts of Portland aren't very Portlandy. Maybe the problem is that we're talking about Portlandness in a very restricted way. And this is a very narrow way of looking at Portland. It's one that highlights the things that are happening in the center of the city, but maybe doesn't reflect the experiences and sense of places that are happening in other places. So we thought to ourselves, well, how do we do this now? We want to make maps. We want to represent sense of place. And so we came up with something else, and that was the idea of a cultural atlas. And there are a bunch of cultural atlases that have come out in the last few years that we really liked. And we thought, well, we should do one for Portland as well. So what is a cultural atlas? A cultural atlas is a way of providing us with new cartographies and geographies of the city that we live in and that we think we know really well. Uh, a cultural atlas challenges our geographic imaginations. Uh, a cultural atlas is not comprehensive in any way. It's not like a gazetteer where you can look up sort of the boilerplate information that you want to see, but rather it tells us stories about a particular place. And it uses maps in order to do that. And speaking of maps, and maps are extremely powerful. As geographers, we talk about the power of maps over our, our, over our imaginations. And a lot of people give maps an enormous amount of authority. When they see a map, well, that's what's there because it's on a map, so it must be correct. But of course, maps are not the places themselves. They're only representations of places. And a lot of maps use the same symbols and the same conventions over and over again so that we can read them very easily. And I think this makes sense to a certain degree. If you went to Google every day and they had different symbology for everything, you wouldn't be able to use it to navigate very well. But we're not trying to get people to navigate here. We're trying to get people to understand different experiences of a place. And this is a really good example. This is a map that one of our cartographers made of a sound walk that she made through Washington Park, Burnside, and the surrounding areas. And by using color and shapes and different intensities and words placed in different arrangements, she tries to give us an experience of this. And so for the rest of the presentation, I want to show you eight more page pairs that we put together in hopes of communicating different senses of Portlandness to people. This is called Mission Invisible. And we had a group of students one summer, and David and I, we went out and we walked all these streets and we counted all the security cameras in downtown Portland. And we counted over 400 of them and we mapped them. And then we got a layer of, of information, GIS information that had street lights on it. And we had one of our cartographers map the path of least surveillance from <laughs> Union Station to Kramer Hall, where our office is. And the subtext here is that there's an enormous amount of security cameras out there on the streets that's watching us all the time, and there are good and, positive, good and bad things associated with that. But we thought that this map wasn't enough to tell the story. So if you look at the book, there's a second page pair that accompanies it. And it's got an essay, and it's got photographs of all kinds of different security cameras, because we felt in order to tell the story, that we wanted to tell, we needed to have more than the map. We needed a suite of graphics and text and infographics 
and the map. And so a lot of the pages don't just have maps. They have other things that help us tell these stories that we want to try to tell. And again, this is data that we collected ourselves. <clears throat> this map is called Islands of Diversity. And what it maps is ethnic and racial diversity in the Portland area. The areas of highest diversity are represented as island highlands, and the areas of lowest diversity are represented as ocean trenches. The topography and bathymetry of diversity in the city. And of course, this isn't just the city. This, the extent here is the urban growth boundary, which is 72% white within this image right here. Of the top 25 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, after Pittsburgh and Minneapolis in that order, Portland has the whitest metropolitan area. And the pattern is different than you would see, for example, in cities on the East Coast, where you would expect to see a lot more diversity in the center of the city uh, and, that might, and, and less diversity on the, on the margins of the city and the peripheral parts. And that's something that's different than here. So it's maybe a slightly disarming way of looking at what could be alarming information. And so from that macro scale to the micro scale, uh, this is a map. Uh, that one of our cartographers made by walking around his neighborhood and chronicling all the stop signs that had something written or stenciled underneath imploring us to stop doing something. <laughs> and I know you've seen them. Be stop war. Stop eating meat. Stop rewarding failure. Stop drop and roll. <laughs> stop hammer time. <laughs> They're all out there. And this, is, this represents the kind of daily geographies that we often don't even see. They're right there in front of us, and we pass by them. And so by making this explicit, it gives us yet another view of how we might be experiencing this place that we call Portland. Uh, this is a revitalized walkability score for the Pearl. Walkscore.com, maybe you've heard of it. They rate the walkability of neighborhoods throughout the country. And the Pearl is one of the neighborhoods that they rank as the most walkable in the entire country. So we had a student who kind of took issue with this. And she did some research and looked at the criteria that they used for determining this. And what she realized was, was that the major criteria that they used was whether your path would bring you to some place where you could buy something or not. And so you had all these places that didn't have sidewalks that had pretty good walkability ratings. And there are places in the Pearl that have no sidewalks at all. So she came up with her own criteria and instructed us. And we took a class out there. And again, we walked the streets ourselves. She had the radical idea that any walkability score should be determined by actually walking those streets. <laughs> we desperately wanted an illustrated map in the atlas. And um, the maps that we each carry around in our own heads that sort of explain how we understand cities are called mental maps. That's what geographers call them. And mental maps are very intimidating to do. I've handed out pieces of paper to students in class before and had native Portlanders paralyzed when told to make a mental map of their own city. And the only people that we could find that were brave enough to illustrate Portland were 55 third graders from Jason Lee Elementary School in East Portland. And you can see it's a little bit different than other maps. It's absolutely beautiful. Most maps don't have mom's house or mom's work located on top of it, right? But mom's work is on this map. And look at 82nd Avenue. 82nd Avenue is a vital, important place full of meaning for the students here. And that's not true for everybody, obviously, in the room. Because a lot of people in Portland, that's not part of their mental map. That's not part of their geographical imagination of the city. They leave it out. So we want to make sure that was represented here. Uh, you may have heard of colony collapse disorder, which is the debilitating set of circumstances that is causing the decline of bee populations throughout the world. And so we wanted to talk about how that was happening here. So we got some data um, from backyard beekeepers to chronicle their experiences with their hives from the fall of 2013 to the spring of 2014. And what we realized was that for this population of people, uh, the colony collapse disorder was 60%. 60% of the hives were lost from 2013 to 2014. Uh, and so although Portland does have a reputation for environmentalism, it does also at times have a conflicted relationship with the natural environment, and that's something we wanted to highlight in the book as well. So these are two pages from a series of pages in a chapter called Wildness. To live in a city and to really understand and know a city is to know something about the power relations and dynamics in that city and also the lived realities of those differences in power as well. And what we've put together here is a map of historic redlining and urban renewal in Portland. Redlining is the practice by which um, 
lending was restrained in certain ways so that African Americans and other uh, members of racial and ethnic groups were only able to live in certain areas and denied entry into other areas. Um, and uh, Dr. Karen Gibson here at Portland State has done extensive research on that, and so we checked in with her research and able to recreate this map that depicts something that for some people is a very intimate lived reality they deal with every day, and that for some people they're barely aware of, and this is largely invisible. <laughs> so another thing that we can do is, is try to map the way that we experience a world perceptually through our senses, and that's something that's called psychogeography. The idea that there is a geography to our emotions and our experiences in place. And, and you know that a smell, for example, of cut grass or cotton candy can bring you back to a moment in time and a place and make you feel the way that you felt back then. And so we wanted to look at different aspects of psychogeography. And one of the things we wanted to look at was geography of sound. And we thought a good place to do that would be at the Timbers game when they were playing the Sounders. And this was a game that was last year, April 5th, 2014. And we have, we've divided Providence Park up into five sectors, and we have 102 small multiples of that. And we put people in each of these five sectors of the stadium and had them take decibel readings every minute of the game and the minutes leading up until the game so we could create this sort of soundscape of what was happening throughout the game. And the darker the red, the louder, the higher the decibel readings. So can you tell the four goals that Portland scored here on this map? <laughs> Unfortunately for the Timbers, the game ended at a 4-4 tie, but, but I think it benefited the map, so I, there was, there was, a, there was a, a win here, I think, for somebody. And again, each of these maps, are, these are eight, I think, 70-plus different topics that we have to try to get people to think about Portland in a slightly different way. Again, whether you lived here your whole life or whether you've moved here recently, I think there's something new for people to learn about the places that they live in. This was a collaborative project that involved over 40 different people. Um, and our lead cartographers didn't make all the maps, but they made most of them. They're incredibly talented. So we wanted to make sure to acknowledge uh, these folks, our graphic designer as well, and everybody else who helped put this together. I hope that this gives you a slightly different look at Portland and a deeper understanding of Portlandness. Thank you.